I am honored to see all of you here and grateful that you all showed up. In the early days of starting a business, you hold meetings and sometimes I've had halls as high, as big as this one, and two people would show up. And those are the days when you wonder if you're in the right business. In any case, uh, I just thank you for a time to just sit and chat a little bit and I'll talk a little bit about the book. I'm honored that the school has encouraged all of you to read this book. I don't know if they give you a test on it or not, but somebody around here decided they liked it and that it was a good book. Uh, it's been out about a year. It sold well. They're going to put it in paperback. That's, uh, that's what they tell me. And so uh, I'm honored by that. Uh, oddly enough, that was a book I didn't want to write. I had a gal who did PR and stuff for me at Amway, and she said, you got to do another book. This is my fourth book. And I said, no, I've written everything I'm going to write, and I've told everybody all I know, and everything I know I got from somebody else, and it's somebody else's, in somebody else's book anyway, so, you know. And she said, but the difference is, if you write it, somebody else will read it who might not read it. So I said, okay. So she said, I'll shop it. Now, I can surprise you that I have an agent in Hollywood. That surprised me, too, that... And one of my earlier books, they had hired an agent. So she gave it to the agent and said, see if you can sell this book, see if you can get anybody who wants to print one of your old speeches. And this is really one of my old talks. And so uh, he went out and shopped it, and this company said, yes, we'd like to do it. And not only that, they said, we'll give you a, uh, an advance. Now, most of us struggle wrong to get a publisher without getting an advance, but they offered an advance. And I thought that was pretty good. So I said to the PR gal, I said, you and the guy who helps you write can have the money, we'll just go ahead and do it and see what happens. And so that's how this book came to be. The speech I gave for many years was six phrases. The publisher said, 10 phrases sells better. So we now have 10 powerful phrases. <laughs> that doesn't really matter. There are 100 powerful phrases that you can use. You will make up your own phrases. There the purpose of all of this book is to teach you how to be what I have termed a life enricher. Now you have a goal of getting out of here and getting a job and starting a business or whatever your hopes are for the future. I have a goal that you will become, in addition to that, a life enricher. That is, you will take it upon yourself a challenge to be a person who lifts other people up so that they will have a richer and fuller life. Sometimes those things are done by a word, a phrase, a note. And I have written about those simple phrases that make a difference in the lives of people. And this book will teach you these phrases. It's not complicated, it's not sophisticated, it's not any big scientific deal. It's teaching you to learn how to look for the good in people. There is good in everybody. Everybody has certain things they're exceptionally good at. Everybody's got things they're dumb at. But if we look for those things in which they are good when we are talking to them, we can honor them by talking about the things they're good at. And I'll give you some stories of how that changes lives. Now, the other day I was, in fact, I was down here in Florida, and they asked me to give a talk to one of our groups of people in Japan. And the guy that was introducing me said, you know, he said, you started your company in 1959. He said, that, you, know, you know that that was a bad year economically. Why did you start your company that year? And I could have said, because Northwood started that year, therefore I knew it was a good year. <laughs> but Northwood started the same year we started. And we were probably within 75 miles of each other. And so the founders of Northwood and my partner and I became friends with them. So we have followed the growth of Northwood all these years, and they have followed ours, and so we have interrelated and interconnected all these years. We supported everything they did. My second son attended Northwood at the Midland campus and spent four years there. My oldest son, who had dropped out of college, went back to Northwood at a later time and took some classes and got credit for his work at the company and 
he had taken on the whole international side of our business and developed it into a worldwide business. Today we're in 80 countries of the world. 92% of our business today is outside of the United States. That tells you something about where business is going and where when you want to run a business you ought to look today. You need to think in terms of a worldwide business because it is a one world deal that we're working in. And so, in fact, China is our biggest market, our best market. And Chinese people are ambitious and hardworking and it's unbelievable because this company was founded on a free enterprise concept. And here we are in communist China where they are practicing free enterprise today. We have a very large factory there and millions of people who sell our products there. And we have stores all across China as well as distributors. And it's turned out to be a marvelous deal in throughout the whole Orient for that matter. Nevertheless, that's just a little bit more about how it all began. But the real purpose of the story was the guy introducing me said, well, 1959 was not a very good year. Why did you start then? I said, well, first of all, I didn't know it wasn't a good year. He said, what? I said, was it a bad year? He said, it was sort of like the times right now. A lot of unemployment, difficulties, uh, that market was down. And I said, well, glad I didn't know all that. <laughs> and then I realized, as you may wonder, as you leave here and wonder whether this is a good time or a bad time, I'm going to tell you something. It doesn't really matter. It's your time. You don't have another time. You weren't born 10 years later or 10 years earlier when you were so-called good time. This is your time. And you have to deal with what it is now. And that's why it's going to be a good time if you make it a good time. Just as we did. And so we started Amway in a bad time. Our time, however. And it proved to be a good time. So don't feel sorry for yourself that this isn't the best time to be going to college or graduating from college or starting a career or starting a business. It's the only time you have. You will never be 21 again or whatever age you are. That's going to go away. And so you have to use it and run with it and make the best of it. And if you determine to do that, it will be a great year. And these will be good times. It's your time. Remember that, because you hear so many people tell you it's not a good time. It's the only time you have. Now let me just start giving you some stories from this book a little bit. I was born in 1926. That was in the beginning days of a depression, much worse than we have today. My father was unemployed for many years. We had to move in and live in my grandmother's attic. So that's how we started. A kid came to the door one day selling magazines. He said, I have to have a dime for this magazine or I can't go home and it was already dark. He was probably a 10-year-old boy. And my grandfather said to him, I'm sorry, son, we do not have 10 cents. I didn't know it was a bad time. I went to a parochial school. I don't know how my parents paid for it or my grandparents paid for it or how they made it work. All I know is I went there and I was grateful for that. And that's when you realize the wonder of God's life, God's hands on your life. See, I believe that God has his hand on my life. And he directs my life. And he knows the dumb decisions I'm going to make. And he knows the bad ones and the good ones. And so I live in that faith. And so I work and I trust you will. That God loves you. That his son died for you and that he has his hands upon you. I know you didn't come here for a religious sermon. It's okay, I'm not gonna stick with it. But I'm just gonna let you know 
You ought to know where I come from. If you're going to take a half hour or an hour out of your life to listen in, you ought to know who you're listening to. And so that's what I am. And that's what I believe. And that's the basis of what I write. Now, there are 10 phrases in the book. It sells better, they say. I don't know. But the first phrase I put in the book was, that I think, the most difficult phrase to answer. And the most difficult phrase to use because it applies to you and not to them. And that phrase is, I'm wrong. And the second phrase which goes with it is, I'm sorry. Now, I know that's, you know, you never made a mistake, so it's hard for you to say you're ever wrong. <laughs> And oh, you've never cheated on a test, and you've, you've never taken anybody else's notes, and you know, you've never done any of those things. You've never hit a kid or done something else wrong when you shouldn't have, you know. You're just perfect. I, I understand that. But in case you ever do make a mistake in the future, then remember this phrase to say, I'm wrong. Now, I'll give you a few examples of it about how you might think about it. I noticed when our guys play basketball, if they made the foul, they put their hand up. Not always, however. I don't expect them to. But you know yourself when you probably made a foul. The trick is admit in admitting it. I had a man send me a, in fact, I was talking about this book and he came up and he said, a friend of mine, and he was a medical doctor, and he said, a man with whom I'd had a bitter disagreement 10 years ago sent me a Christmas card this year. And on the bottom, he wrote the words, I'm wrong and I'm sorry. And he put a little PS, he said, I just read Rich DeVos's new book and I realized that I owed you this for 10 years. Now this man immediately called the other guy and they had dinner together and they've been, they put their lives back together and their friendship back together. But for 10 years, they didn't speak to each other and had this little thing hanging on their shoulder for all those years because somebody couldn't say, I'm wrong and I'm sorry. Today, you're going in business and today is a day in which we have labor relations and fights with management and labor and unions and, and all this. And oftentimes, one side or the other is wrong, clearly wrong. And you see strikes and people be out of work and losing income and all sorts of things because somebody couldn't say, you know, we're doing this wrong. Maybe we ought to work together instead of against each other. Maybe we ought to find a way just to make a better car and make this thing work together. But no, our pride or our ego or whatever, we're going to show them. We're not going to give in to them. And the whole industry is destroyed. And thousands, if not tens of thousands or millions of jobs are lost. An industry which was the pride of our country shifted to, to, to Japan because a group of people couldn't admit they were wrong and they were sorry and they needed each other to get along. Pride was the destruction of an industry. That's my opinion. There are a lot of opinions of what went wrong. I live in Grand Rapids. I grew up in Grand Rapids. My business is near Grand Rapids. I live next to Detroit. I watched the Detroit. I watched them try and unionize us and organize us. And so I've dealt with them. But it's a conflict that should not exist. If you want a union, have a union. But the union should be to help the companies achieve. Because if the company doesn't achieve, you're both going to be out of business. The achievement and success of the company is what makes it all work. 
But there are times when somebody just say, you're right and I'm wrong. Many years ago, we were accused by the Canadian government of not paying our proper customs duties. We had paid them that way for 17 years. We had paid them the way the government had told us to pay them. But because of political disagreements, we being conservative and the current prime minister at that time being very liberal, if not communist, hated our intrusion in constantly talking about the advantages of free enterprise. And he said technically, and it was on a very slight technicality, that we had not paid what he thought we owed. And so they made the case. We finally had to say we were wrong. Either that or go through another 10 years of being condemned and ridiculed and held up to everything you could imagine in the newspaper and trying to put you in jail. We finally said, okay, we're wrong. That settled the case. Not too hard to say you're wrong, is it? Not when they're threatened to throw you in jail. <laughs> but sometimes you have to say you're wrong under those conditions. But most of the time, you should learn to say I'm wrong earlier than that. Now I have a third son who is my youngest son. He listened to this talk, he traveled with me. All of my children would travel with me and listen to me speak and they'd heard me talk about these things periodically and he came home uh, an hour or two later than he should have. And I was up waiting for him, he was in high school. And I'm a little steamed by now. My older son said, if you think my dad's a good speaker, you should hear him talk at two in the morning. <laughs> That's when he makes his best speeches. But my son walks through the door, opens the door, and knows I'm mad, and knows I'm waiting. And he said, hi, Dad. I'm wrong, and I'm sorry. <laughs> Now, what do you do? Huh? What, what do you do? You're, you're disarmed. You're, you're just shot. You know, you're done. All you can do is hug them and say, well, I'm glad you're home safely and that you're okay. And give them a kiss and go to bed. Disarming somebody by being able to say, I'm wrong and I'm sorry. It's an amazing thing when you learn to use these phrases. There was a time when my wife was having surgery, she had cataract surgery in her eyes, and I, I had no problem with her having the surgery, but, and it was, it could have been, it was early days, long time ago, when they did the early, earliest times they were doing cataract surgery, and, and uh, you could do and stay in the hospital overnight, or you could come in the next morning and have it done, and she said, no, I want to go in the night before, I, I'm emotionally, it'll be better for me, I'll be more relaxed, and, I said, well, you don't have to. We can go in in the morning. And I either resented the time or resented the cost, I, probably both. But she went in the night before. I decided I would ask the doctor if I could watch the operation. I was on the, I was chairman of the hospital at that time. And he said, well, okay, you can scrub up. Come on in and watch. So I did, I watched the operation. It isn't life-threatening but it's your eye. And to watch him go in and carefully cut around the edge of the eye and remove the lens and then very carefully vacuum it out and insert a nice new lens and sew it back together. It was a, a little more traumatic than I thought as I watched the skill and the magic going on in front of me. And so uh, we got back up to the room and I said to her, I said, Helen, I'm wrong. And I'm sorry that I was uh, nasty about your idea of coming in the night before. And she said to me, she said, you know, I don't think I've ever heard you say that before. And she was undoubtedly right. I had a hard time saying that. You're young, your pride, your ego, you can't be wrong, you got to be right. And that's the way a lot of us felt, feel when we're young, especially. 
And so we'll lie sometimes, we'll do a lot of funny things to avoid saying, I'm wrong, I screwed up, I made a mistake. And I want to just lay before you the idea that learn to say I'm wrong and I'm sorry. Even if you're not sure you're really wrong. If it's a close call, admit you're wrong anyway. Rather than carry this bitchy attitude with you and cocky attitude that you've got to be right. This simple change or you, on your part or learning to say these phrases will change your life forever. You are beginning your life. Begin knowing how to say you're wrong. As a Christian, you know, we talk about being sinners. It's hard to admit you're a sinner. But you can't have a savior unless you admit you're a sinner. So acknowledge your sins, acknowledge your weaknesses, and acknowledge your shortcomings. But that doesn't change your strengths. That doesn't make you less good or able. It just lets you acknowledge your humanness and improves your relationship with other people. They'll th you know, they won't think of you, who does that guy or gal think they are anyway? And you'll begin to improve your human relations skills as you go along. Anyway, just one little phrase that can make a difference. I have had hundreds of letters since I wrote this book of people telling me their exact story of how after reading this book, they learned to say they were wrong and they were sorry. First two, only eight to go. The rest don't take so long. Because from here on in, it all turns into positive things. It all turns into looking and seeing and greeting and being with other people and finding ways to say complimentary things to them. I know sometimes you don't think there's anything good in those people. That's because of your own vanity. But pretty soon you will get used to it. If you want to be in business, if you want to get along in life, if you want to become aware how God's hand is on everybody, then you will begin to see that there are good things and great things in everybody. I tell my grandchildren, I said, you know, sometimes there are kids in your class that aren't very attractive. <laughs> Maybe more than sometimes. <laughs> but you know, that's something they can't do anything about. <laughs> they didn't ask to be born to ugly parents. <laughs> And sometimes they are. I'm, I'm not putting them down. If you say, you know, sometimes people are just not as attractive, right? Huh? But even those are attractive. If you will seek to find the attractive things about them. The person who may not have the prettiest face may have the best personality, however. And may have the best speaking skills if you'll seek them out. In our business, we used to say, if you're going to have speakers on your program, find somebody who's good looking and speaks well, or find somebody who stutters, find somebody who's not so attractive. Because then people will say, when they look at it, they say, wow, if they can do it, then I can do it. All because you begin to look for the skills in other people that you might otherwise miss. And it's usually the attractiveness that turns you off first. And if you were born to parents that are reasonably attractive and you think you're reasonably attractive, thank God for it. You didn't have anything to do with it. <laughs> you just happened to be born there. Now, I have to say that to our grandchildren because, see, when you 
get cocky about what kind of car you have or how you travel in a private airplane or whatever. You had nothing to do with it. You were just born into a wealthy family. You're stuck with it. I had a grandson who was kind of critical. He said, Grandpa, don't put your name on any more buildings. I don't like it. <laughs> it's embarrassing. <laughs> I said, I know. I'm sorry you're stuck with it. You know, it's just tough to be born in that situation. But there are a lot of people who are born in a bad situation. And they have to live with that situation and overcome it. And you have to overcome yours. That's the reverse of most situations, isn't it? I hope I got them over it. You don't control those things. You have to live with them and overcome them. And so when you find people who aren't naturally attractive or naturally good communicators, mm -hmm. that's when you have to be the star and look and find the other good things to talk about when you talk about them. Now some of those phrases are, I'm proud of you. And when they make a speech, it might not be as good as the hot shots up there. But for them, coming from a point of stuttering or of never having spoken before, it's the biggest achievement they will ever make and you will ever see them make. And it's time you tell them how proud of them you are. Because for them, that's a great achievement. Since we all start at different levels, they may not arrive at the star of the class, but if they got to halfway up, they would be better than you who got to the top because their achievement was greater. They traveled farther. They did more. And if you'll be sensitive to that and start to look for that, you will say to them when you see their C, say, I'm proud of you for getting a C. That may be the best grade they ever had. For me, mostly, it was the best grade I ever had. I was a poor student. But in high school, I took Latin once. I graduated on the condition from that class that I'd never take it again. I kept my word. But when I graduated, a man who taught Bible, preacher, wrote in my yearbook a phrase to a clean-cut young man with talents for leadership in God's kingdom. When I grew up, we didn't talk about leadership. Leadership was a strange word. Today, you talk about leadership and becoming a leader, and there are leaders and all this. We, 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 we didn't talk about a leadership. We didn't have leadership classes. And, and so he says this to me, and I, would, I, I kept reading it over and over, and I say, wow, what a nice thing of him to say to me. And I refer to it often after that as a source of encouragement when we struggled with our businesses. And I would think to myself, you know, this guy thinks I can do it. Maybe I can. Forty years later, I did end up as a president of the class, just because I was a jolly good fellow, I guess. Because I surely wasn't a good student. I was never on anybody's honor roll. In fact, mid-year through my high school, my dad sent me to a technical school and said, and I was in a Christian high school, they were paying tuition, and he said, I'm going to send you to a tuition to a public school, maybe you can get an education, maybe they can do something with you. He said, I'm not going to waste my money on it if you won't study. And that was true. Maybe a kind of a waking up period. But when I came back, I did end up being class president, and 40 years later, I'm, I'm having a class reunion, and. And Dr. Greenway that was there, that man I mentioned to you, that Bible teacher, and I said, Dr. Greenway, you wrote something in my yearbook 40 years ago that I've never forgotten. And he stood up and he said, let me tell you what I wrote in your yearbook 40 years ago. And he quoted the line back about leadership ability. I 
said to him, I said, Dr. Greenway, did you write that in every kid's yearbook? <laughs> no, he said, I did not. I confirmed that. But that he would remember it 40 years later was an even greater compliment. And so I say to you, when you give a compliment to somebody that is kind of in need of a little encouragement, one of these phrases, perhaps, or one you make up, 40 years later, somebody will say to you, you said something to me 40 years ago that was very much encouraging to me. And you can say up, stand up and say, let me tell you what I said to you 40 years ago. Because when you do those things, you will remember them. And while they will feel better, I assure you, you also will feel better. And so that's the context of all these phrases. So let me just run by them because the rest of them are kind of easy. You can remember that. You can even pass a quiz on it. I have to say one more thing about saying I'm sorry. And there are other ramifications of that. I told you how we had to say I'm sorry. But I have a granddaughter who had a boyfriend in high school who graduated the year before and he kept taking her out and so she skipped school a great deal. And so when it came time to graduate from high school, her grades weren't good enough to get into Michigan State where all her friends were going. And they wouldn't allow her in. That is, despite the fact of knowing the admissions officer and knowing the president of the university very well. In fact, we brought him over to the house to talk to her and let him tell her why she wasn't good enough to get in because her grades were bad. She knew she wasn't dumb because her grades demonstrated that when she went there, but she just wasn't there enough to know what was going on. And so she never did get into Michigan State. He told her that she ought to go to a, did I drop that or did that? Can you hear me all right, is that better? Yeah. Uh, he said you ought to go to a community college so she went to a community college in Lansing, East Lansing, just because it was near where all her friends were at Michigan State. She never did get into Michigan State. She continued her time there and got through there. And in her last year, she decided to come to a place called Northwood. And last spring, she graduated from here. That was a very special event for our family. We were all there cheering her on. She was an all A student in the last year because that was the day and the year she decided to become a serious student. Education is not often that you got the brains, it's often that you don't study or become a serious student. I think when I went to school they would say he's not college material. That's what they told the school about me, the high school. That he's not college material. Don't send him into pre-college courses. He's not smart enough or good enough or whatever. They were probably true at that time. I've concluded since then that we all grow up at different speeds. And we all get serious at different times. This may be the time when you're getting serious about your education. We grow up. And so this is your time to be praised and honored for what you're doing. For some of you, I could praise you just for being here. The fact that you took the trouble to come here. But I also can commend you for making a wise choice of coming to Northwood. I'm a great believer in Northwood. I think it's one of the few schools. Am I, you going to straighten me up? I'm going to straighten you up. My neck or the, that thing? Clean that up for me. Thanks. I did, did I knock it down? No, I couldn't do that, could I? I'm a sinner, remember? All right. Thank you. See if you can make me look good. Or at least sound good. 
It's uh, your time. This school is going to teach you real things about a real world. And so making a decision to come here is the first great thing you ought to be proud of. You chose a school that's going to teach you how to build a career and a life. And that's not true of many colleges today. I used to give a talk called the three A's. It's called action, attitude, and atmosphere. I still give that talk. Attitude and action and atmosphere. You want to take the correct action. Action is determined by your attitude. And attitude is determined by your atmosphere. And the first thing to do, whether you're new here or whether you're leaving to graduate soon, is to always put yourself in an atmosphere where you have a chance to succeed. Put yourself in the presence of people who think like you, who want to get ahead like you, and will lift you up. So not only am I encouraging you to use phrases of, uh, phrases of encouragement, but to be an encourager, but to hang around with people who do that. My granddaughter got in the midst of people who talked her down. Fortunately, she found some people who talked her up. After all of her struggles, she's now in Chicago in a law office preparing to go to law school. That's a nice achievement on her part. I used to threaten her. I'd say, you can't get into this family if you don't get out of college. <laughs> And she'd say, oh, Grandpa, what do you know about it? You didn't even go to college. That's true. I, that's why I know it's important to get through here. This is not what it was when I was a child. This is a big world, a challenging world. I always lamented that I didn't. My oldest son dropped out of college just like I did and then realized his mistake. And then he came back and talked to the people at Northwood. He had worked at the company, he had taken Amway and built all of its international business, and they said, well, you've done a lot of things, we'll give you some credit for those things, and they're gonna make you come on campus for some things, and we'll give you some homework, and he graduated with high honors. Because Northwood believed in him, as they believe in you. Good atmosphere you're in here. You're amongst good people who want to achieve. That will help you in your achievement. Now, phrases. You can do it. It's in the book. You'll see it. It's a lifelong phrase for me. First of all was, I'll just sum it up where I'm wrong and I'm sorry. And my second, third phrase is, you can do it. As I told you, I wasn't a great student, but my father being born up in the depression and living in the depression and being unemployed and all that, I, I, I was amazed by his positive attitude. He kept saying to me, whatever you're gonna do, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it. Get in business for yourself, you can do it. You know, a lot of people don't think they can do a business of their own. They think they get out of school and are trying to say, oh, I can't get a job, there aren't any jobs available. Then start a business. Don't sit and wait for other people. And his, so when I was in high school, I never thought about going to college. It wasn't on my priority list. I was in World War II. All my high school years were World War II years. As soon as I was out of high school, I went to war. So, I mean, that was a different period. But his words were the get in business. And I met a guy in high school who became a lifelong friend and a business partner for a lifetime. We live next door to each other. We build our business together. Our families still own Amway together. And all we talked about in high school was getting in business. And when we come home from the service, we talk about getting in business. And out of that came this huge business. 
Because of the atmosphere I was in at that school, I met him there. Because of the atmosphere I was in there, Dr. Greenway wrote those encouraging words in my yearbook with talents for leadership. Atmosphere. Putting yourself in the right place. Hanging around with the right people. I have lots of employees, I have thousands of employees. Some of them can't wait to get out of the parking lot. They complain to me at my employee meetings that how come they don't have a traffic light? It takes them so long to get out of the parking lot. <laughs> they don't seem to have a problem getting in because they always come late. <laughs> They're the same ones who always complain to me. Why does the management have parking spots up front? Why do I have to park out way in the back? I said, because you're always here late anyway. It doesn't make any difference. <laughs> Those parking spots would not be sitting empty. When you get here, you're late. Then he'd laugh, and I'd laugh. I say, if you want to change your outlook around here, you got to get to be what I call a hustler. You got to get here a little out early and you stay a little late. And the supervisor said, uh, hey, anybody help? A little over I need a little overtime tonight. I said, be the first one to put your hand up. And always leave a little late. Let the others leave before you. First of all, the traffic's easier in the parking lot. <laughs> but then if the supervisor needs a little extra help, you're the one who's going to get the overtime. And after a little while, pretty soon, when he's looking for somebody to advance a little bit, he's going to say, you know, you ought to go see and so and so. He's an ambitious person. He's always here early. He's always ready to help. He, he's a good guy. And maybe your situation will change. It's those little things you do that change. So my word of my father, or you can do it. Start a business for yourself or keywords. I don't have a chapter in there on my father's words of getting in business, but they're important words. So those are number 11 if you want, others are free. <laughs> Other words for you to use. Now I have another illustration for you. I was chairman of the largest hospital in Grand Rapids at a given point in time, not too many years ago, 15, 20 years ago, and I said after a board meeting one day, I said, we should merge with that other big hospital in town. And everybody said to me, no, you can't do that. Everybody tried that. That's a big hospital, and you can't, they're not going to merge. And I said, you know what, I'm going to try it. And my president at that time, who ran the hospital, said, okay, you want to go for it, let's go for it. We got it done. Today we have a huge hospital system called Spectrum Health. We employ about 16,000 people. We have a half a dozen hospitals under our control today. We operate hospitals all over western Michigan. We have a brand new Helen DeVos Children's Hospital being erected right now. We have the Devan and Institute of Research right next door. We have Michigan State University just put in a medical school next door. None of that would have happened if we hadn't taken the opportunity to try and merge those hospitals. Somebody said to me, you can do it. Distributors all over the world, when they ask for autographs, say to me, tell me I can do it, will you? Write the words, you can do it. And then sign your name. And I do that. My real phrase always is, however, is love you. And you will see in the last phrase of my book, that's my moniker, that's my phrase, to let you know that I love you. Because you are created by God and you're just as important as I am. And you have just as much ability as I've ever had. And most of you probably have more natural ability. The rest, you're going to have to develop. And I believe in you. Is another phrase. I believe in you. That's what I've been talking about. I believe in you. I believe in your potential. Amway is 
experts of three million organizations today. I've dealt with probably 20 million people and families in that process. To end up with those three. Others quit for other reasons, dropped on, went on to other things they thought were better, made stupid mistakes like that. But that's all right, that's their business. But that doesn't make me lose my belief in them. I believe in them. They just chose to do something else, that's okay. You are all gonna do other things. Maybe not things I would do, but they're important to you. And I want you to know that I believe in you, even if you don't join me, join you. Do whatever you like. It doesn't change my belief in you. So learn to say to people, I believe in you, even if you don't agree with them on what they do. I say that to politicians. I, say, I, don't, you, I don't have to agree with everything you believe in to support you. I was with brother President Clinton the other day. Now, I'm a Republican. He's a pretty big Democrat, last time I looked. I just had dinner and lunch with him the other day in New York, in fact. And, and we talked about the things we disagreed upon. But you see, that doesn't mean I don't believe in him. We just don't happen to agree on certain things. And he may be right, and I may be wrong. But whether he's right, or I'm right, or he's wrong, or I'm wrong, it, that doesn't change my belief structure. That's just something we disagree about. I may have a little more belief in the individual's ability to take care of themselves. And he has a little less belief in them and believes that the government should help them a little more. That's just a fundamental belief that's been going on for a long time. But I can be a friend of his, and he says to me, he says, well, we don't agree on a lot of things, but we're, be, we're good friends. And we are, even though we disagree with each other. Learn to get along with people and tell them so. This isn't a question of these phrases that are nice to have. These are phrases that are only good when you share them and use them and pass them on. And so I was, All right, I, I believe in you. I, I don't agree with you, but I believe in you. I'm proud of you. Thank you. I need you. We all need each other. I once was living in a little cottage near Grand Rapids and garbage guy would come through in the early in the morning and you know how cottages are, windows are open and noise travels and you know how loud garbage cans are. And he would come through at six o'clock in the morning, you'd never hear him. And one morning I said to my wife, I'm gonna get up and tell him because he's really good. And I went out and talked to him, and I, I said, I just got up here to tell you what a good job you do. You not only pick it all up, but I said, but you do it quietly, and you do a nice job. And then he said, Mr., I've been doing this for 20 years. Nobody's ever told me I do a good job. I said, well, let me be the first. How many people do you have around you like that have never had anybody tell them they do a good job? Probably quite a few. Think about putting that phrase to work. And when you learn to do these things, you'll see the good in others, your life will change, and they will see the good in you, and your life will be a different life. I trust you. One of my helicopter pilots once went down in Lake Michigan. Tail rotor had quit because of a cable that broke, and it had gotten flat position, so it wasn't pulling. And so he lost control of the tail, and the tail was following the helicopter. And he got it down safely. The when the floats broke and it inverted, he had six people on board, and they rolled over and sat on the stomach. Because they got an SOS out, a helicopter from the Coast Guard got out there, and it was November on Lake Michigan. And it would not have been a good night. But they got out there before dark, and they were picked up and rescued. The next day I called him in the morning and I said, I want to go to Chicago today. He said, okay. And so we got in the helicopter. He said, where do you want to go to Chicago? I said, I don't really want to go to Chicago. I just want to go flying with you. I want you to know I have trust in you, that I believe in you. 
that I know you're a very competent pilot. So we can go back to the hangar now. There are things you can do if you look for them like that. And I have been trained, I trained myself in learning how to look for good in others. And that's the genesis of the book. Rick Fiddler is now our chief pilot. Sikorsky helicopter said that nobody had ever brought a helicopter down with that kind of a failure before. It's now in all their books as to how you land a helicopter if you have that failure. Somebody had threaded a threat, put the cable through the wrong slot on the pulley, and in rubbing back and forth, it finally snapped. It snapped over Lake Michigan that day. He got it down. It could have been nice. Good for you, Rick. Thank you. I chose to go for a ride with him. I respect you. I was once on a television program. Can't even think of the guy's name now. He was a big critic, and especially a critic of Amway, and he deceived me, and he put my, everybody said, don't go on that show, and I said, I'm gonna go on it, he's gonna knock me apart, but let's go on it. So I went in there, and he, stepped, he brought all the bad, all the distributors who were unhappy on there to sit in front of me and, and tear me apart up and down, and I sat there and smiled and answered the questions as best I could, and, Afterwards, I got a little postcard, not a letter, a postcard, so everybody could see it. And it said, DeVos 10, Donahue was his name, Phil Donahue. She said, DeVos 10, Donahue nothing. That's pretty nice. Came from Barbara Bush. She just wanted me to know I did a good job. That was her way of sending a little letter to say, I believe in you. I respect you. And as you move ahead in your lives as achievers, which I expect of you, your words will be more important. Today in Grand Rapids and elsewhere, I have secretaries who seek and read the papers every day and find out what significant things people are doing. <coughs> not big things, not necessarily. They did a good job, school board, or public servant of some kind, city commissioner did a good thing. And, and so I used to say, write him a letter and send him a book. And I have a form letter, and they wrap out the letters and just tell people how proud I am of them and what a good job they did and send them a copy of the book. I send out thousands of them. I have people stop me in the street, say, I got your book, I got your letter. I have people tell me years later, it's still hanging on my wall. Just because somebody wrote him a letter. In the world of Amway, I have people who write me about their sons. I have a son who just graduated in Eagle Scout, and I write him a big thank you, a little note. I write little notes. I don't dictate letters. They get too monkey and too formalistic. So I just wrote down, I'm proud of your son. Give him my best. And then I send a little note for him. And, and a woman said to me, she said, you know, that was three years ago you did that. I still got it on my refrigerator. Why is that important? It's only important because they hear it so seldom. That's why it's important. Nobody else did that. The Grand Rapids Symphony president the other day had just settled with the union and I called him and I said, congratulations, you got that thing settled, good for you. You, you all worked together and you worked it out and I'm proud of all of you. You know, he said, I thought a lot of people would call me. He said, but you're the only second call I've had. He said, I thought this was a huge achievement for our city to get our symphony settled. Well, it was. But not many other people wrote him a note or did anything. They, they may have thought it, but that didn't, that didn't count. Thank you notes to your professors. Thank you notes in social situations. Thank you notes when you have dinner. Thank you notes all the time. Keep a pad handy, write notes all the time. Don't send them an email, send them a handwritten note. They, the mail still works for that. A handwritten note does a lot more than an email. I don't know why. It shouldn't, but it does. Just because it's personal. I know you had to type it up, but it's not the same. So there's my 10 phrases. Not very complicated, not very sophisticated. 
but it will change your life. Believe me. Because you will begin to seek the good in others. See the good in others and tell them. And I come here today to tell you that I see the good in you. I see the kids who graduate from this school. I see the achievements they're making. I see two sons that graduated from here. I see a granddaughter who graduated from here and who was barely struggling to get through college suddenly says, Grandpa, I'm going to go to law school. What happened? I don't know. Something happened here. To lift her sights so she could do better and go farther. That's happening to you or it's going to happen to you or it's happening to you today. I come from a poor home. And I don't know where you come from. But most of you don't come from wealthy homes. You come from places you have to struggle. So that's okay. Don't underestimate what you can do. And my father's encouraging words, my partner's encouraging words, my preacher's encouraging words, my distributor's encouraging words, my willing to try things, and we end up on today with a huge business all over the world. By the grace of God, I don't believe it. It's hard to believe, but I give God the glory for it. And he made it happen, and I reflect in that glory, and I pass it on to him, and I am here today because I wanted, I wanted to be here today. I wanted to come and talk to you kids. I wanted to come and tell you how good you are. I want to tell you what a great school you're in. And that this is a time that you can make a big mark. When a lot of other people are hurting and going down, this is when stars like you will shine. So don't be afraid to take it on. Take on the world and take on every opportunity you see and start something new if you have to. We started many businesses. We started a flying school and we didn't know how to fly. We went on a sailboat to sail to the Caribbean had never been on a sailboat before. We sank off Cuba. <laughs> Went on our way to South America anyway. Started several other businesses that failed. Started a restaurant once, and I recommend everybody have a restaurant once and get over with. <laughs> Terrible business. You gotta work like a dog. If you wanna have one, go get it, but get it over with. It's, I own three big hotels today, so I have a lot of restaurants. Not because I got to sit behind a register and watch it. Tough business. But you can do it if that's what you want to do. It just takes a business of dedication. There are no easy businesses. But there can be great businesses because you can do the one thing that everybody in this country and in this world wants right now. You know what? Everybody wants a job. And if you can start your business and do that, you can help all those other people who didn't go to Northwood and can't start a business of their own. I believe in you. I trust you. I respect you. I'm proud of you. And I'm proud of this school. Thanks for listening.
it, it always impressed me. I, I made a pretty good wage doing it, and I finished college, and uh, so thank you. Wow, good for you. And secondly, I'd like to thank you for changing my husband lately. <laughs> now, this book, we've been, my husband read this book, um, uh, The Ten Powerful Phrases, and literally it's on our kitchen counter. And for those of you who know me, I have the opportunity to be here with you, and my husband's in Michigan, and he comes back and forth. And as you know, there's always challenges that come up in your life, and my son, who is, you know, 29, almost lost his job because of the economy, and my husband quoted this book several times to him. So I would um, encourage all of you to take a good look at it. But I'm sure you must have some questions that you would like to ask. Yes. So you said you've had failures in your business and that um, you've just moved past them. Um, how, I understand people saying I believe in you and you had support, but how did you really get yourself over the hump and try something else even though you just failed at something? Uh, what motivated you to try again? You know, we were determined to be in business by ourselves. And, and so we were so determined to do that, it was not a question of whether we were going to be in business, it was only a question of what kind of business. We ran this little restaurant at our airport, and so after that we immediately, those of you that got to run, run along, it's all right, we're just having fun here, feel free. Uh, and, and so when, when that business would fail, our first business was a flying school, but the government stopped teaching kids to fly, so we closed that up. Then we bought the sailboat, and we sank, and then we came home, and the, the first thing, we, 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 start, we bought products through South America and Central America, and we thought, well, we started importing those, and well, that didn't go very well. So then Jay's mother, my partner's mother, was taking Neutralite, and we said, well, let's go sell that a little while and see if that works out. and, and like that worked out. Nothing. You never got discouraged. Like. Yeah, you always get discouraged. But uh, that, that we just look on to the next thing we're going to try. We were in a toy business. Uh, we were making much, beautiful horses. You know, a nice little flat piece of plywood, a little handle on it, had wheels on it. You could roll. That was going to be great. That's the year Wonder Horse came out. You know, that beautiful molded plywood black by plastic horse. We never sold one of them. I still burn the wheels in my fireplace. You know. <laughs> <laughs> We, we, then we made ping pong tables for a while, but you know, you know, we would try everything, and then we started selling Neutralite. We bought a sales kit for fifty dollars. So well, let's go try this. See if we can make this work. Then we went to a meeting in Chicago, came home, and said, "Let's go do this." Sold everything else we had, all the other businesses we were uh, messing with or trying that we're going to focus on. After we got Amway going, and we're quite successful, and we're, we're personally very wealthy. We decided we were going to buy a, a radio network. We bought a, a national radio network. And it, it didn't go anywhere. And we wanted to have a, commentators on there that extol the virtues of free enterprise and so forth. Uh, it, it, it never made any money, and we couldn't get that thing going because we didn't really devote time to it. We were busy with Amway. But, so one day we said, let's get rid of all these other little things we think we can do and concentrate on the one we have. So we owned a lot of little businesses in there, but we decided we had a focus. We had two, we owned big radio stations, a big national radio network. But we decided we had a focus, focus on the one that was going the best for us. And we just turned our back on the other and said, let's go. And uh, that was a pivotal change for us because we were thinking we could run anything and do everything. And that was the day we decided we had to focus on something and really see if we could make this business go. And that changed this whole thing around. You know, when people know you're committed, they become committed. When people are working for you, see your commitment, their commitment's different. If they think you're doing this for a while or temporarily, then they'll keep looking for jobs too instead of giving it everything they got to make that business work. We found that changed everything for us was focusing. But we, we had a restaurant, we tried that for a little while. You know, we, we would try everything, and if it would work, it would work. If it didn't work, we'd try the next thing. But we never gave up on the idea that we were going to own our own business. And that's why we started Amway, because Amway offered other people a way to start their own business for 50 or or 
and provided a worldwide opportunity to eliminate all the objectionable things they had to put up. Normally, if you build a business, you gotta put supply capital, then you gotta have more capital. Well, you can get an Amway business and you don't need capital. You don't need to have $1,000 or $10,000 to invest. You buy a $100 kit and you have as big an opportunity as anybody. I'm, I'm not here to sell you on the Amway deal, but, but those are the things we looked for. What, what were the things we stumbled over? What were the things we thought other people who wanted a business of their own would look for? And so we kept refining that process and we kept making it richer and richer and richer. We had an annual 50th anniversary the other day in Las Vegas and, and I'd have 5,000 people there and I'd say that all of them made upwards of a half a million each. I mean, that's worldwide, but that, those are successful people from those countries. We were translating in 20 some languages. That, that just shows you how far something can go when you believe in it and work on it. But we started it with $50. And there were a lot of days we wanted to quit. And there were a lot of people that came with us and failed and didn't make it. And we began to think there's something wrong with us. But it wasn't wrong with us. Just, they just weren't ready for it. You know, when you're associated with some people who don't do well, you think there's something wrong with them. No, it's just not the right time for them to do this thing. And then they go off and succeed at something else. And they come back to you and say, you know, you gave me the idea that I could do it. I didn't do it here, but I did it in the next thing. That's great. See, I, I tell all our Amway people, if they leave you and quit on you and go off and do something else, don't feel like I feel. You won. You launched them into a career, not with you, but someplace. And our goal is to help and make other people's lives better. And if they win, then we win. It's always, you know, Christ teaches us to serve others. So it's always you first and me second. Help others achieve and then you achieve. Keep that as your basic philosophy and you'll have a successful business. Find a way to serve them. But it's just not very complicated when you keep the priorities straight. I saw an old guy who's 83 and been through a lot of war. Fought a lot of battles. Governments who ridiculed us and challenged us. I fought the FDA and the FTC and country and government and China and Russia and wherever you want to name it. They all said, oh, this doesn't work. You can't let people do this. But every place we go, the people do when they work, they make it work. And we stand behind them and help make it happen. But it's, it's a great question. But uh, failure is just something you do. You know, people talk about poor people. You know, there's all these poor people. I said, no, there are not all these poor people. These are temporarily poor people. They just moved on. There is no one fixed group of poor people. That's, that's last year's people. There's a new group moving into that category now. And those who were there, we hope, have moved out of there. Don't think is that a static situation. Sometimes we see a lot of people in poverty and say, well, they're all poor people. No, no, those are, those are the temporarily poor. They're going to move out of there. We're going to get them out of there. We're going to do everything we can to get them out of there. But they have to take charge of their lives and say, I'm not going to live like this anymore. And I had a letter from some guy like, like that. It just came to me. I got to remember the detail. I can't. But... A, I, think it was a, I think it was a ball player who said, I decided I wasn't going to be poor anymore. In fact, it was. It was one of the guys we had. We didn't keep him this year. But he wrote me a letter afterwards and said, I read your book. I got home and I read your book. And I have them all over to my house at the beginning of every season. And we have dinner and play ping pong and, you know, they play pool. And they, they just have dinner and chat around. And our family gets to know them. And, and, uh, and this guy was the only guy at the house who wasn't signed up. And so I gave him a book, and I, I don't know why. The Lord leads you to funny things. I sat, and I talked with him. And I was encouraging him, and he was a very bright guy. And, and so we're just talking, and, and I really didn't take, take that much time with anybody else that night. Just didn't work out. And the next morning, they tell me they let him go. They didn't sign him. And I thought, oh, I feel sad about that. And then I get an email from him. And he's telling me how grateful he was for that little time we had together and how much he enjoyed the book. And he said, I decided I was, I said, I'm going to make it. I'm not going to make it with you. I'll make it somewhere. But he said, after reading your book, I've been encouraged again. He said, I was poor and I decided I was not going to be poor. 
the rest of my life. Well, that's what happens. People move on if we give them hope and chance. You and I got to be in the business with what's in this book of lifting them up. And we don't know where they're going to go, what they're going to do. All we know is they need a pat on the back today. They need an encouraging word from you or a little note. And next thing you know, they're doing something better. You and I can make a difference in people's lives. I know. I've been doing it all my life. People say to me, what do you do for a living? I say, I'm a cheerleader. <laughs> I was a cheerleader in high school. I, I worked after school. I couldn't play sports. And so I was a cheerleader, even though they didn't have cheerleaders. I'd just go out on the floor in the basketball game, and I'd lead a cheer. It's just because I wanted to. But that got me started in being a cheerleader. And all I've done all my life is, it, so I've run all the world telling all these people, you can do it, you can do it. Next thing you know, I got a billion dollars. They tell me I'm a multi-billionaire. Well, that's good. You, you know, the government spends billions. They don't, nobody over there knows what a billion is. They don't, haven't made it, I guess. But, you know, a billion dollars is a thousand million. Whenever you hear them say they're going to spend a billion or give a billion, that's a thousand million dollars. They can't spend that much money intelligently in a reasonable amount of time. But they pass it out pretty easily. We gotta be more responsible for that. But we are the makers of people. This school is a maker of people. People who come here go out of here with hope and a vision and ability. That's why you came here. You are going to be grateful for all your life that you came to this school. Maybe even that you came here today. Thanks for that question. You got a longer answer than you wanted. <laughs>